1945 tore our car to Beulah Celia, <laughs> and all the little minor blows that we have today. This is, uh, you see the Patrick Channel in the background though. Patrick was smart enough to realize that when his first house was washed away, built right next to the shoreline, that's not a good place to build. So he built it in closer and tucked it to the dunes. Burton, his son, my granddad, he built a fortified house up in the dunes, no windows, just a door, about 10 by 10. Because he wanted some place to get in if he got caught again in the next storm. That, that is what I'm going to This, that house is, is located right there. These are the set of pins. Uh, about every 15 miles, you had a set of pins that you'd, you'd run the cattle to and, and do your work. And this is a fine old South Texas barn. So all you people from not around here, you get little old scrawny barns in Pennsylvania in the Midwest. We knew how to build them back there. You know. <laughs> and, and, and you see the pins that matched. Uh, well, Patrick got kind of like uh, his, his mother, and, and I've inherited a little bit of that uh, with it, that you, you may do with what you got. So if it didn't wash up, you didn't use it. So all of this, uh, you know, he, he had one house, somebody asked him, why'd you build two stores? He said, well, the saw didn't wash up. That's <laughs> And then this was my grandfather, Bert Dunn. That's my mom next to her, or aunts, or uh, great aunts for some of you all in here. Uh, Bert Dunn was born in 1889. Uh, he died in, in 1970 on there. He grew up, you know, ranching was in his blood. It was always very much part, a part of him. This, this picture was probably taken on uh, Mustang Island with it. He had four daughters, my mom being one of them, but she was kind of his guy uh, with it with four daughters and uh, he loved horses, he loved cattle, he loved ranching. He not only ranched both Mustang Island and Padre Island, but he had uh, he leased the uh, Los Machos Ranch in Jim Wells County, ran about uh, 2,500 head of uh, cattle on that. This, this is Ada Wilson. Ada Wilson's uh, husband, Sam E. Wilson, bought Mustang Island and 1944, and uh, Burton partnered up with Sam E. Wilson. Uh, the Duns didn't run, they just ran cattle on uh, Andre Island prior to that. So that, that's when the Duns started ranching on Mustang Island. Before that, you had the Grants. The Grants uh, ran both uh, cattle and sheep. You had uh, before them, it was the James, there's the old Corpus Christi guy with it. And in time, and the Mercers who Rick and, and the museum have done a great job with, they would uh, drive cattle, they would pick up the wild cattle. They need a little bit of money or whatever. Both the cattle in the Mustang Island back in the 1860s and 1870s, and they would actually drive them to Rockport with it. After, after the Mercers and the other Puerto Rancos locals, the, the Littles acquired title. There was no title to Mustang Island prior to 1868. So it was kind of free reign. And that, that's when the actual patents were issued. The Littles got it, and, and then the Grants. The Grants le leased it to the Jameses with it, and then they did it. But I can remember my granddad telling me, you yeah, know, they ran those damn sheep on there and they just tore up the dunes. You know, he was always kind of down about them tearing up the dunes. But if you all know how heavy the grass is now, here, here's a picture. There were, cattle didn't do up the dunes any wonder to you. Uh, it. But, but Ada bought it. Her husband was an old man. He didn't want the island. He didn't want the surface. He wanted the minerals that sat under the surface. So he went to the Grand Estate and he said, I want to buy the minerals. Those guys were tough bargainers. They said, if you want the minerals, you have to buy the surface too. So they forced him into buying the land. 1944, he paid $15 an acre. 8,000 acres of Mustang Island for $120,000. You hear about the Wilson cut uh, with it. It didn't have much oil under it. Uh, with it. They found a little bit, but uh, that's how the Wilsons came to be. He died about eight, uh, 1960. Uh, his widow, Ada, still remained partners with it. She was a big philanthropist. Uh, 
She was responsible with the state park. She was a driver getting the 20 something hundred acres for the state park. With a, and a very, not known here on the island, but a very important contributor with, with the state park. With now, this is what uh, Rick was talking about. This was going probably from Mustang Island to Pottery Island there at Packard Channel, Corpus Christi Pass, what you want to, whatever you want to call it today. There are the cowboys there at the end. They, they pushed them across with it. You can see they're, they're swimming back there. Historically, Corpus Christi Pass was deep. It would be 12 to 18 feet deep. You'd have a bar out in the Gulf about four feet deep, but the pass, pass itself was it, just moving animals. Uh, how do you, you took your uh, cattle on there. A, a couple of routes, I remember my granddad talking to me, one place they would drive them to be uh, close to where Kingsville is today, the Caesar Pens. The Caesar Pens were owned by the King Ranch, named after Caesar Claiborne, one of the most important of the kings, uh, Caesar King Claiborne, with it. And they would gather them up at the Black Hill Point, <coughs> driving Black Hill across the lagoon and then going across the King Ranch. Of course, they had permission to it. And this would be about a three-day affair, 40 miles with it. They'd load them up in the Caesar pens, and then off to Laredo, get on the Tex-Mex Railroad. I, I tell my granddad, 1809, he told me the story that uh, he was 19 years old at the time, and this was his first, his, his dad patented. This, this was his first where he was uh, given the free reign to do it, always before Patrick or one of his, his people had done. But he entrusted Burton to do it. So they had 900 head of steer. They, they drove them across there, drove them to the seizure pens, and he said, ah, he got to drive right in the caboose all the way to Laredo, 19 years old, sold the cattle in Laredo, had a nice chunk of money in his pocket. You can imagine a 19-year-old in the railroad at that time, kind of a big wig rancher and things. <laughs> then, then he got a telegram from Corpus, come on home. So that, that kind of is uh, dealing the right a little bit. Uh, okay. But that, that was one way of getting cattle across. Another way, where the causeway is today, if you were driving from Padre Island, you didn't drive them across the causeway where it is today, but further south, uh, where Yorktown Boulevard is, about uh, 20 miles south of where the causeway, because where the causeway is is muddy, it's boggy, and, and the cattle would have bogged down. And there was a state road, and that state road went back to the 1830s, it was a hard sand bottom, there was no intercoastal canal, and you could drive the animals all the way across. You could take a wagon all the way across. The water might be up to the hooks with it, but that's how you got back and forth. And the stakes were to get you out of the bog. And if you got into the bog, I can remember Mother telling me about it. One of our horse, it was a, a bear, one of her favorites on there, and, and that horse bogged down. She called it quicksand, but it, it's really more of that bog and lost it. So, or the cattle, you had to be careful with them. Uh, you'd lose the cattle going across. So you had to be very particular with it. Again, yeah, that, that was a long, uh, dried out thing. If you were driving from Mustang Island, you would go, Rick alluded to that, you'd drive across right now where the uh, Corpus Christi Ship Channel is today. It was mud flats, where, where we all see those big ships going by. That was dry grounds most of the time. Some of the time it would end the day through there. You would follow along Harbor Island and its various shores. You had uh, Corpus Christi Bayou, which it wasn't wide, about 100 yards wide. You'd have to ride <laughs> cattle there. And then you'd go to the Packery uh, in Rockford with it. So that, that's how you uh, got them there. Uh, if they can bring it back up, I've got a good picture of the the ferry started, they started the railway, uh, what, about 1910? You had rail come out to uh, Port Aransas and then a private ferry. So then that gave a, a couple alternatives to it. 
Uh, we, the causeway was built, the JFK causeway, in uh, 1951. So once that happened, uh, trucks became available uh, to the island. So, but in, in, in working cattle, there would be about three or four full-time cowboys. Growing up, we lived in Flower Bar, and we lived on one end of the property. My granddad bought it in 1919. Paid $600 for 15 acres, and he had some cattle thrown in the deal uh, with it. But on the other end, and that's what we call it, the other end is where Walmart, that new Walmart is today, uh, that, that's where the cowboys would stay. This was after the JFK Causeway was built, and they would drive over every day, do, do their thing, and just all that. And, and on the island, you had some day-to-day. -day. You had to help water. And to get water, you, you, dealt, you dig what we call a tank. The tank wasn't very big. It was about 8 feet wide and 16 feet long. And the water would seep up from the ground. So one of my tasks, helping my granddad out, would be to check the water in the tanks. And he'd say, Greg, go see if that water's salty. And they may have a hundred cattle drinking out of any one of these tanks. And let me tell you, cattle are not a real particular beast. Uh, they don't necessarily go to the side. They'll go get in the tank and drink straight out of it and, and those kind of things uh, with it. And that water, you know, Island groundwater isn't pretty water to begin with, so I would kind of move the scum aside, back and forth, and whatever floating debris was sitting on those tanks, and check that water out. Let me tell you, it always tasted lousy. But you know, I said, oh, granddaddy, it tastes good. And I guess a testament our we're a little stronger. I'm still here today. Uh, you know, we all have to drink bottled water these days, but uh, you can drink the water out of those tanks. But about every half, there were 75 tanks on the island. So every couple of miles, you had tanks. That, that's where they watered uh, on there. And then later in the 40s, they put windmills in there. To get fresh water on the island, real deep, it's the Port Aransas folks know here, it's about 20 foot down to, to fresh water. So, you know, there weren't much of a windmill. And always when a storm was brewing, it was, oh no, worrying about uh, blowing down, the windmills blowing down. But about twice a year, it's time to get a cat. And what you do, my sister here, Linda, she participated in some of those drives. Jennifer, I'm sure, was, was part and parcel to some of them. But you would go and you would ride out about halfway to one of these camps, these five camps that I talked about, take the horses off, drop them out, and then start running them back to the pens or driving them back. And when I say drive, you're just walking, walking. Here, here's, there's an example right there of a drive. You can see the cowboys kind of staggered around there. They're going into the Novia Pens, which is close to Bird Island on, on the National Seashore. They're about 150 head in that picture. So that represents that 10 miles of the island that they were picking for. So they would spend the day doing that, put them in what we call the trap, about a 20 acre pasture that they could eat. And then you work the cattle. And Working cattle, you, you brand them and vaccinate them, you separate them out, the, you, you take the animals that are going to market with it. But uh, it, it was a lot of hard, hot work. It would take about a week in every camp. They had a chuck wagon that went along with it. it they called it a kitchen. All it was was a, a shed with a, a long table on there. Uh, that's where the cowboys would eat. Uh, Linda has a great story on that, that uh, she and my mom, they would go out and participate. And, and all the cowboys were Hispanic, we, you know, them or Mexicans. Uh, and they would go down and, and sit at the table, and, and everybody sitting there, and uh, David Cooper, who was an associate of my grandfather's, he would be with, with them, and, and David could speak Spanish like a native. And, and my mom and, and Linda would go there, and, sit at the table and all the cowboys and just kind of start you know, the patrols daughter and granddaughter they didn't want any part they kind of migrated away so Linda and, and mother ended up taking their meals uh, elsewhere with it. They, didn't, they didn't want to run the cowboys out so keep on
But uh, you, you drove the cattle in, and, and then you went the most interesting part of branding, branding the calves. And the calves would be, oh, 100 pounds and three or 400 pounds. And you, you would put a set in, inside the pens, about the size of this room right here, not, not counting the back portion. And then we'd wait in there and, and start throwing them. My partner Buddy is here. He participated in a few few of those times. But to throw an animal, a smaller one, you grab it by the ear, you grab it on the flank like that, put your knee in there and lift up. And that's where a scrawny 150-pound guy or then that time 120 can throw a 200-pound cow or calf with it. Once they're on the ground, then it's time to brand, vaccinate, and castrate. A little bit different time than we had here right now. Those calves, that wasn't a very happy moment for them. <laughs> you, you had a, a fire going. Here, here are some of the uh, brands. That's the WD Wilson Dunn. There's some D brands. That's a heart brand that my son uses and my dad used, Heartsmith. But those would be orange hot in the fire. They come over, they brand the animals. Another thing you do, since you didn't know if you could see it on the side, you want to lope off part of their ear too to mark them. So you cut off the tips of their ears. My uh, the done ear mark was the two, the two tips of the ears cut off. And then if it's a male, he uh, had the unfortunate to be castrated. Mm -hmm. So those three quick operations happened with a certified, uh, hopefully a sharp knife. <laughs> and, and I'll never forget it. it yeah, these poor little creatures, they're separated from their mom. They're in there after you get done and you pair them up. And those poor guys, you know, they're walking, they're just bawling and crying and, and stuff. I, I, I'm glad we don't have any pictures on the internet or we'd all be in jail like that. <laughs> now, now, now we got animals going. Uh, I call this a, a bad day at the ferry, talking about how you got the island, or you got cattle out of the island. This was taken around 1947. This is the ferry landing right there. Then it was wood. You can see they had a little too many cows in that uh, truck. <laughs> now, it, it, it's, it's a rough picture, but there's a cattle truck leaning down. You can see the ship in the background. <laughs> well, cowboys have come with the horses to the rescue, so let's get them out of the truck, head, head them back down the aisle, and there will be no, um, no cattle today on that. But they, yeah, I, I can imagine my granddad getting that call about, uh-oh, uh we got the truck broken out in, in half at the ferry landing, and it's halfway <laughs> under the water. There was a, a guy that helped my granddad. His name was Buck Gilliland. He was an old fixture around here at Port Aransas. His, his wife was, of course, postmistress. Buck, the only thing he ever wore were section overalls and, and nothing, nothing in it. And typical of uh, Port Aransas, I don't think anything has changed. Buck had an affinity for beer. And this was around the ferry landing right there. And they, they call them command cars. Uh, they use those a lot on the island surplus deals. Somebody bet, but I bet you a case of beer you won't drive that command car over the ferry landing. Back at that time they just had a chain going across there. Well that was a dumb bet, bet to make to a good old Fort Ramsey. So yeah, he drove it. He bought his case of beer. <laughs> so I, I think they had that was either before or after the command car. And this was the last another surplus army vehicle. This was in 1971. That, that's Jack Everett. He's a second generation cowhand for the Duns on there. He's looking for strays. You can see the horse in the back of the truck right there for the last bit of uh, animals. And, and I was talking about the grass. Take a look. That's what the dudes uh, looked like back there. But they would use this truck. All the pins were located on the inside behind the dunes. Well, an 18-wheeler, they, they couldn't go back across there in that soft sand. But this was an old six-wheel six drive army truck with it. And then they, that truck would go out to the beach, back up to the 18-wheelers, and unload uh, that in there. But the, the end of, of ranching on Potter Island, uh, 
when the National Seashore was established, that uh, there was a 10-year lease on it, and that was in 1960. And when that lease ended up, that was the end of the Dunn era. It went from 1879 to 1970 at that 10-year lease. My granddad at that time was 80 years old. He died shortly thereafter. That always, it was 80 years, the island was very much apart, and uh, I think that was one of the things that contributed, uh, you know, what's there to live for if there's not an island. The, the last cattle, major cattle, came off uh, Mustang Island, and 1968 after Hurricane Beulah. There has been some cattle on there since there. The Flatos, they acquired some. Matt, my son, who's back there someplace, he still has those first, a few head left. So there, he's six generations. Jim, the computer guy sitting here, Jim and his wife, Bobby, they're out there helping out there. They are as typical of uh, Mustang Island ranchers come from the East Coast and by way of Canada and things, but he's bought a cowboy hat and he's doing a darn good job. <laughs> and yeah, I told everybody here, especially all my friends uh, from five years, is the one time you see me in a cowboy hat in this rig. Usually I'm working cattle on, I have uh, a knit shirt, shorts, and top siders. So that's, that's the island way. But, my granddad, his great grandfather, they always wore long sleeves. And as I go and uh, make my six month visit to the dermatologist, I think, gosh, you guys are a lot smarter than I was. <laughs> but I like, thanks everybody for coming. If you have any questions, uh, be happy to answer.